Thanks for tuning in to my portion of today's program. Uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to take us on a journey back into Toronto's history to visit the city as it was during the Second World War. I feel that when many people think of the Second World War or any of the other great and terrible global conflicts that Canada has participated in, they imagine the critical clashes that took place on battlefields halfway around the world. And in many ways, this is a very understandable perspective. But what I hope to illustrate for you today is that as soon as the war began, the people who stayed here at home fought the war in their own way. They weren't military combatants, of course, but they still made contributions and sacrifices. The war at home was fought economically, socially, and emotionally. Some people still remembered how the First World War had changed their lives only a little more than 20 years before, but others found that the Second World War not only altered their daily routines, but also offered them brand new futures. Canada declared war on Germany on September the 10th, 1939. War clouds had been gathering for months by the time that Canadian Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King broadcast the news to a tense public. One of the most immediate effects of the war was the call for young men to enlist in the military. Recruiting posters went up all over Toronto and the rest of the country. The one that I've shown here is one of the better known posters. It shows a Canadian soldier wielding a rifle in front of the Royal Union flag. In this slide, the poster on the left represented Canada's new army as motorized and modernized knights of old and appealed to a sense of gallantry and adventure. The poster on the right promoted the alleged thrill of aerial combat. Other posters used nationalistic characters. At left, the Canadian beaver goes into battle side by side with the British lion, who is a Churchillian-like cigar clenched in his mouth. At right, the beaver sinks his teeth into the work of fighting Hitler. Recruitment posters and other enlistment campaigns were initially very successful and volunteers flocked to join uh, the colors. A total of 58,337 recruits enlisted in the Canadian military just in the last three weeks of September 1939 alone. This photograph from October the 7th, 1939, shows the 48th Highlanders marching from the old University Ab Arm Armories down to their training camp at Exhibition Grounds. The picture almost resonates with patriotism. Thousands of people lined the streets to watch as the Highlanders were accompanied by their full brass and pipe band, as well as their mascot, a Scottish staghound named Kinross. The first contingents of Canadian troops who were recruited at the start of the war arrived in the United Kingdom by about November of 1939. These recruits supplemented the British Expeditionary Force and over the next several months, the defense of Britain became Canada's main military role in Europe. But by 1941, Canadian military personnel were also serving in the Far East. Two battalions of Canadian troops made up of 1,973 officers and enlisted men, as well as two nursing sisters, arrived in Hong Kong on November the 16th, 1941. The Canadian troops, many of whom were from the Winnipeg Grenadiers or the Royal Rifles of Canada from Quebec City, joined a garrison that now totaled about 14,000 Allied troops. Together, these troops fought an overwhelming number of invading Japanese uh, invaders. The Battle of Hong Kong lasted for just over two weeks from December the 8th to December the 25th, 1941. By the time that the British colony surrendered on Christmas Day, 1941, 290 Canadians had been killed. Another 264 Canadians died over the next four years amidst the inhumane conditions of Japanese prisoner of war camps. Canada started reinforcing its defenses along the Pacific coast in 1939. However, these were intensified after Canada declared war on Japan on December the 7th, 1941. But the opening of the Pacific theater meant that the Canada needed even more uh, military resources. The Air Force alone had over 3,100 personnel in the Pacific theater by 1945. By the end of the war, more than 10,000 Canadians had served or were serving in Asia and the Pacific. The ongoing demand for resources, for personnel, for ships and ammunition and airplanes and food meant that anyone who stayed behind on the home front uh, was called on to do their bit and contribute to the war effort. 
This meant that women were recruited for the war effort too. And these posters were for the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division at left and the Canadian Women's Army Corps at right. Both organizations were established in 1941 and they recruited women for non-combatant roles like secretaries, mechanics, cooks, and so on to free up men to fight as soldiers. In this recruiting poster, members of the Canadian Women's Army Corps march alongside an ethereal image of the medieval heroine Joan of Arc. Several posters seem to promise that Canadian women would become sisters in arms, but this message was a duplicitous one. Unlike whatever this poster suggests, I wouldn't say that it was a woman's world in the 1940s. Nonetheless, thousands of Canadian women went on to make contributions that proved that the Second World War was their war too. So how were the lives of those who stayed at home in Toronto affected by this great need to contribute almost everything to the war effort? Well, rationing was one of the most common ways in which people on the home front contributed to the war effort. Here you can see a group of British women buying Canadian eggs in 1940. Food from Canada was essential to the survival of Britain and other allies. Soon there were posters promoting rationing too. The rationing of sugar started in July of 1942, followed by tea and coffee in August, butter in December of 1942, and then meat in March of 1943. This photograph from March of 1943 shows a customer at Eaton's department store waiting at the counter while the store clerk counts to make sure that she has the appropriate number of ration coupons. Scenes like this one would have been duplicated again and again for the remainder of the war. Victory gardens were another way that wartime civilians helped to provide extra food. If Canadians could grow more produce in their front yards, vacant lots, and former uh, flower gardens, then it was easier to stick to wartime rations. A lot of recreational activities were canceled during the war, but keeping a victory garden was a way for Canadian families to enjoy a wholesome and patriotic leisure time activity. At their peak in 1944, there were about 210,000 victory gardens in Canada, growing 57,000 tons of vegetables. Victory gardens spread it up outside private homes all across Toronto and in vacant lots outside of factories too. Digging for victory helped to boost morale by making people feel like they were contributing to the war effort. Gardening became an enjoyable diversion from the less pleasant realities of war. There were plenty of inedible items that were also in short supply. These Toronto children organized an aluminium drive in September of 1941. Metal, paper, rags, and other materials were collected for recycling into the war effort. Even bones were collected to extract glycerin to make explosives. Fuel for cars and trucks was in short supply and while horse-drawn delivery carriages had hit their peak in the 1920s and 1930s, they started hitting the streets of Toronto again in the 1940s because gasoline was rationed. <coughs> Even with homegrown food and essential materials being recycled, the government still needed extra money to help pay for the war. The government helped to pay for the Second World War by the sale of war bonds, which were also known as victory bonds. All sorts of posters were issued to encourage Canadians to invest in war bonds. Some were lighter and almost comical, like the one on the left portraying Hitler as the devil, or the one in the middle, which uses the image of an attractive blonde woman to sell investments. The one on the right is a little bit more sinister, portraying the Germans and Japanese uh, as reaching out for a mother and child with their monstrous hands. There were all kinds of rallies, like this one held at Toronto City Hall in 1941. The building is decked out in bunting, flags, and banners that beseech the public to help finish the job by promising that any money will buy tools for Churchill. The Toronto Star newspaper published several wartime photographs accompanied by articles that explained what victory bonds could buy. One of these photographs profiled the Valentine tank. The paper said, before shipment to the battlefields of Russia and Africa, a Valentine tank is put through its paces. It is given a grueling 18 mile test run before it can be passed. Valentines cost $75,000 or $750, $100 victory bonds. The Toronto Star ran this photograph with the caption, too bad Hitler's not here. 
lament these eight war working grandmothers as they train Sten guns on the photographer's assistant. There are some 70 grandmas working at this small arms plant near Toronto, most of them anxious to prove they can shoot as well as to make guns. The war effort even affected clothing. By 1943, Toronto had ex experienced an extreme shortage of coal. At the same time, the government requested that all Canadian homes be kept at a somewhat chilly 65 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 18.3 degrees Celsius. This was to uh, help conserve fuel for the war effort. The Globe and Mail newspaper ran a feature suggesting what to wear in a chilly house. An Eaton's department store came out with a special line of cold houseware. These three women modeled the wool suits and dresses, jackets, shawls, and knitted slippers that Toronto uh, residents could wear instead of turning up their thermostats. Knitting was a popular way for everybody to help those serving overseas. Basic articles of clothing, such as socks, scarves, and sweaters were always useful. The three women shown here are knitting away in a Red Cross worker. The Red Cross produced a booklet of patterns for specific uses, including mitts designed for those using rifles or radio equipment, caps to be worn under steel helmets, and amputation covers and bed socks for convalescents. This is a woman named Evelyn Cotter, who graduated from the University of Toronto with a Master of Arts degree in English in 1947. She was a founding faculty member of Innes College and helped develop writing programs for the university as well as for the Toronto District School Board. She recalled her own ex experiences as a student at the University of Toronto during the war years. She talked about how other female students painted their legs and even included a painted on seam to mimic wearing stockings. She said, I remember girls in the bathroom at Whitney Hall slapping the stuff on their legs. It seems strange that we'd want to have the appearance. Now, along with metal, rubber, food, and fuel, there was another shortage in Toronto during the war. Many of the able-bodied men had gone off to fight, so women poured into the workforce, staffing fire departments, canteens, and munition factories. Canada became one of the major arms suppliers to the Allied cause, and ultimately, it was women working in factories who made it happen. Bernice Glow was just a teenager when she started working at the Lakeview Small Arms Munition Factory in Port Credit, Mississauga. She said, that was the first time we ever wore slacks in public. Even when you were married, you wouldn't go downtown and wear slacks. It was a time when many people still considered a woman's place to be in the home. And yet, the industrial work that these women did helped the cause of victory and also changed society's viewpoint on women leaving home and going out to work. Other facilities included Research Enterprises Limited. It was located on the south side of the old Leaside Aerodrome, east of Laird Drive between Eglinton Avenue and Wickstead Avenue. This facility produced electronics and optical instruments like binoculars, gun sights, and radar components. The General Engineering Company was out in Scarborough. It was located south of Eglinton Avenue between Warden Avenue and Birchmount Road. This facility was made up of 172 buildings and was the largest war-related production centre in Canada. It operated 24 hours a day, six days a week. The women who worked in these plants were dubbed the bomb girls. Many of them did things that were just as important, as complex and as dangerous as a lot of things that occurred on the battlefield. Every day, these workers handled high explosives, toxic chemicals and volatile gunpowder. A lot of these women had sons, husbands or brothers off fighting in the war. Some came to work in factories because they had too much time on their hands at home. The factories that they worked in became places of both work and play. They were offered golf driving practice, shuffleboard, badminton, volleyball, softball and bowling as a way of keeping up good spirits and a sense of solidarity in the workplace. With so many women going off to work in factories, the question of who was going to take care of the children became an important issue. This photograph shows a Salvation Army daycare center in Toronto in 1943, but many munitions plants offered daycare too. The family unit was another part of life that began to change during the Second World War and childcare started to become a societal concern and not just an individual one. There's one other company that I'd like to mention, the John Inglis Company, was located near King Street West and Strawn Avenue in the Liberty Village neighborhood. 
This photograph shows hundreds of bomb cases that Inglis produced stacked outside their factory. During the war, Inglis turned out thousands of shells, guns, and munitions. But in addition to all those bombs, England also, uh, Inglis also produced an iconic image of Canadian women at work. An Inglis employee named Veronica Foster became known as Ronnie the Bread and Gun Girl, and she went on to represent nearly 1 million Canadian women who worked in manufacturing plants across the country during the war. Foster produced Bren guns on the manufacturing line at Inglis. She became popular after a series of propaganda posters were produced. Many of these posters featured her working for the war effort, although some showed her in more laid back conditions like doing the jitterbug at a dance hall or attending a dinner party. Ronnie the Bren gun girl also inspired the American propaganda icon Rosie the Riveter. It was invented after Ronnie had already become well known. What's more is that Rosie the Riveter was a fictional invention. Well, Ronnie was a real person. Unfortunately, because of the popularity of American media in Canada, I think that more people probably know about Rosie the Riveter. These days, younger generations might take Veronica Foster's accomplishments for granted. The idea of a woman holding down a job, earning her own salary, playing a ball game with her coworkers, or dancing the jitterbug with the plant foreman might not really seem all that unusual today, but professional opportunities for Canadian women were far more restricted 75 years ago than they are today. When the war ended, Veronica Foster took up a career as a model and a musician. She married a trombonist named George Garrett, and the couple had five children. Although her fame ebbed after the war, her iconic status during the conflict was invented for propaganda purposes by Canadian industries. Veronica Foster, along with all those other female workers at Inglis and other plants around Toronto and across the country, shaped the role of Canadian women for the generations to follow. Their entry into the workforce was an unexpected but profound result of the Second World War. This photograph from 1940 shows a rally for the Canadian Corps in Riverdale Park. It was true that the people who stayed here in Toronto and fought out the war on the home front were far away from any actual battlefields, and yet they were still daily reminders of the war everywhere anybody went. Students in Toronto were encouraged to design their own wartime posters, and this photograph from July of 1943 shows some of the top entries displayed at Eaton's department store. Everywhere anybody turned, they were reminded of how their efforts or their errors made an important difference in fighting the war. Children and young adults were trained for potential military service. These young cadets at St. Andrews College were taught how to use an anti-tank rifle. When this photograph was taken in 1943, there were still fear, fears that the war would go on long enough for these cadets to enlist and serve overseas. The Army even held open house programs in local Toronto schools. Here, two girls clad in gas masks got a different kind of cooking class when they were taught how to make their own tear gas in case of an enemy invasion of Canada. The war would end a little less than three years after this picture was taken in 1942. During six years of war, over 1.1 million Canadians served in the military. More than 44,000 Canadians were killed and another 54,000 were wounded. It was a terrible cost. But whenever I look at photographs of children being trained for war, or attending military rallies like this one at Maple Leaf Gardens in February of 1941, I'm glad that the cost of the war wasn't even higher. But eventually, of course, the war started to draw to a close. Victory in Europe, or VE Day, took place in, on May 8, 1945. All the people would, who had fought on Toronto's home front uh, joined in with uh, other people all over the world, at least emotionally, as everybody came together to celebrate. There was a need for solemnity and reflection. The memorial arch at the base of the soldier's tower was inscribed with the names of the 557 men and women from the University of Toronto community who were lost between 1939 and 1945. But there was also a very real, very human need to express joy, exuberance and relief after so many years of war. These students from the University of Toronto piled into a car to celebrate victory in Europe as they drove along St. George Street. 
Toronto's downtown core was packed with revelers and both Bay Street and Young Street were completely shut down. This photograph shows the celebratory mood on Bay Street with ticker tape strewn all over the street and a real uh, celebratory mood in the air. People in Toronto took to the streets and danced, kissed strangers, waved flags and threw streamers. They crowded outside newspaper offices to hear the latest news. They flocked to City Hall. They formed jubilant parades all over the city. They all celebrated the end of the war and victory in their own way. Then on August the 14th and 15th of 1945, it was time to celebrate victory over Japan. When news came of the Japanese accepting uh, allied surrender terms, the city's entire population seemed to head downtown to celebrate. Chinatown was particularly jubilant, full of music, dragon parades, fireworks. Japan had occupied China in part since 1931. But Japan's surrender officially ended the Second World War. Canadian soldiers began returning to their loved ones in Toronto. The city tried to prepare itself for whatever was next. The war had irrevocably changed Toronto and the rest of the country. Many veterans came home with physical and psychological injuries that made it hard to reintegrate into civilian life. Meanwhile, there was an increased government intervention in society with the creation of unemployment insurance in 1940 and family allowances in 1946. But there was a great sense of jubilation too. Although Canada is not currently engaged in a war, at least in a literal sense, I suspect that most of us have felt a sense of uncertainty, of fear, or even of loss in the past year. We've lived through emotional strain and even physical danger. Perhaps we can all draw inspiration from a time when the people of Toronto came together and did their bit to fight a literal war and not just a metaphorical one. I hope that all of you can keep your spirits up as you stay safe and take care of one another. This concludes my presentation for today. Thanks again for allowing me to be part of today's program.